And at this point in time, just to put everything back in its context, Jesus, Jesus has just marked his, his early, his first disciples officially, and uh, they're sitting on this mountainside where Jesus begins giving his first instructions to, to his new disciples. And, it, and in a sense, he's um, laying out the core objectives of his discipleship program. Okay, guys, this is where we're going. If you're going to track with me, this is where we're going to go. And so, and setting that out for them. And really, what he was wanting to do was to lead them deeper and deeper into their relationship with God where he became their very life. Now see, you need to remember what Christ was doing with these men. He was wanting to build into them. He's wanting to disciple them over the next while so that they in turn could go out and teach others and disciple others. And to the level of their relationship with God is the level that they would be able to share. And so they, they, they needed that connection. And so in this particular section called the Beatitudes, um, Christ lays out what the blessed, those who hunger and thirst for, for righteousness, those who are, are poor in spirit, those who um, are, are mourning over sin, persecution, understanding that. And, he, and then he goes on to lead out and share about loving our enemies. And we talked about that. And as you come into chapter 6, there's three components here where he talks about giving to the needy, uh, prayer, and then, and then fasting. And so these flow out of our relationship with God because God, uh, because of their love for him, excuse me, that this flows, this flows out of that to the level of their giving, praying, and fasting is the level of their intimacy with God. And so he's laying this out. Um, these are expressions of relationship. But sadly, what had the religious leaders done with, with uh, giving, praying, and fasting? And so you see that at the beginning of each section, be careful in your acts of righteousness before men. Um, uh, when you pray, uh, do not be like the hypocrites in verse five in verse 16 under fasting when you fast do not look somber as the hypocrites see that the pharisees the religious leaders had taken these um, intimate uh, reflections of their love for god and they turned them around to focus on themselves and so what god was wanting or what jesus was wanting to do was to begin reclaiming this reorientating his disciples that they would understand the core of all of this in the relationship giving is of the heart it's not for show praying is of the heart it's not for show fasting is of the heart it's not for show either so it's not it's not what you give how you pray or when you fast it's your motives behind it it's about your intimacy with god and so it's what, wanting them to focus in. So what we're going to do in this particular lesson is we're going to zero in on, on prayer and we'll look at the giving and, and um, fasting at, a, at, another, at another point in time. And so we're going to look at that prayer is deep communion with God where we, where we express honor, worship, submission, needs, forgiveness, and dependency. And number two, Christ desires to engage with us personally through the study of his word to aid our communion with, with him. So number one, prayer is deep communion with God where we express honor, worship, submission, needs, forgiveness, and, um, and, depend, and dependency. So take your Bibles and let's go to Matthew chapter 6 as I said. Give me a hand. Go ahead and read verses 5 and 6, please, of chapter 6. And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray, standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by men. I tell you the truth, they have received the reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. Okay, so this is early in Jesus' ministry. Like I said, here they're sitting on this mountainside, and he's specifically uh, speaking to his disciples, but there's thousands of people sitting around there. You know, as Christ begins, and when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites. Did the people know what he's talking about? Absolutely. They knew that Jesus was referring to the religious leaders, the ones who made all the rules. Now, can you imagine? And some of them are sitting in the crowd. Like sometimes when we read all of this, we kind of read it kind of static, but there's something taking place here where Jesus has began calling these ones out for what they were doing, and they're sitting in the crowd. So, and, and notice, the words that he, notice the words that he uses, and do not be like the hypocrites. Could you imagine the shock? Has this echoed through the valley and down the mountainside? Can you, can you hear the people gasp and began looking around and wondering, like how dare he make these accusations? Like this is real situation that's taking place. So why did Jesus use such strong language to describe these religious leaders? Why do you use such strong language? Do not be like the hypocrites. Is, like, is there not a, a kind of a softer, more uh, politically correct term you could use here? Like hypocrites. Like Jesus, what are you doing here? Like why would he use such strong language? Yes. Can you imagine that distinct line in the sand? Why else? Why else do you think Jesus used that word hypocrites to describe these men? 
all pretending, an outward show, something that, something that, they, were, that they were not. They, they acted as if they loved God, but really, what, what were they doing? Who did they really love? They loved themselves. It was all about lip service, all through the motions, was it? And what is Christ declaring there as he refers to them as hypocrites? Is he, is he, is he lifting up as somebody accepted, that he's accepting? No, he's rejecting them. And imagine the shock to these particular individuals. You see, these religious leaders, they prayed religiously three times a day, and three times during the heaviest traffic periods of the day, they would have, where they'd have the largest audience possible. And when they prayed, they used the most flowery language possible to kind of draw attention to themselves. Instead, Jesus calls his disciples to pray in private, not to make a big show of it. Pray privately because it's personal and an intimate time with God. God sees private pray, prayer. Now notice what he says here. When your father who sees what is done in secret, what does he declare? Will reward you. Isn't that incredible? Incredible declaration of what, of what he was declaring. Now, now notice here, as we go through this, so prayer is deep communion with God where I tell him what I know he knows in order to get his perspective on it. Uh, prayer is aligning our ideas, our plans, and our attitudes and agendas with God's. Uh, prayer is confessing sin, taking God's attitude towards it. Uh, prayer is praising God for who he is and what he's done. Prayer is an expression of faith and our dependence on our bountiful provider, for, for, all of, for all of our needs. This is, what, this is what he's seeking to do. Now notice that in verses, six, uh, verses 7 and 8 as we come into it. This is what it says in verse 7 and 8. And it continues, And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need, even before you ask Him. And so think about that. So again, the question comes up. If He already knows what we're going to ask, if he said, do, um, notice what it says, and... Uh, and do not be like the pagans, for your father knows what you need before you ask him. And so the question comes up, so then why pray? If he knows what we need, why pray? And the reality is, is because it's communion with God. <coughs> it's aligning our ideas, it's confessing sin, it's prayers, and it's expression of faith and dependence on him. It's that overflow of relationship. At the core of it is relationship. At the core of it is, is communication. And it's drawing that and that communication that comes back and forth. See, endless babbling, vain repetitions, and endless phrases, they reek of pride. And really as we come and praying, what God is seeking us to do is to pray, Lord God, you are good, loving, and gracious. All I need is found in you. Uh, Lord God, I belong to you alone as my sole owner and final ruler. Lord God, I need you to continuously lead me and teach me. Lord God, I exist for you alone. It's that posture of humility. It's that posture, God, I exist for you. And out of that flows prayer. Out of that is a declaration to our God for all that he has provided. You see, communion with God is intimate. It's real. It's not fake. Jesus is seeking to help to see that as you, as you continue. Now notice what it says here in verses 9 to 13. This then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we also forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from, from the evil one. So notice how Jesus, notice how Jesus begins, begins it here. And so this then is how, you should, is how you should pray. So is what Jesus declaring here, is he giving us the only words that we should re repeat every time we pray? Is that what he's saying? And so this is how you should pray. Is that what he's saying? Okay, so every time we pray, we need to follow this mantra, or this words here, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. Is that what he's dictating for us? No, it's not. So, what, so really, what is it? What is he asking of us? What's he, lay, what's he laying out here for us? A template, isn't it? Because, again, prayer is what? Prayer is not cold and heartless. Prayer is, is communion with God. It's not empty words and form. And so what he's giving to us is actually an outline in the components of how we should pray. Now notice, notice this, as you look at, the, as you look at, the, at, the, at the Lord's prayers, as often called, what's really interesting, God is drawing us, in, drawing us in and creating a longing to communion with him. Like notice, notice the terms, how he begins, our Father. 
There's a, there's a sense of, of, of relationship. There's a sense where he's, draw, he's drawing us in. He uses this term father as he originally designed it way back in the beginning and how he desires that mankind would understand it. He's using this term in a way of, to, re, to relate intimacy, integrity, deep caring, provision, and, and protection. And so what he's saying here is our father. This is the one that we belong to and it's the drawing in, the one who who's providing, the one who's walking in integrity um, is what he's seeking. We, we have to be careful as we're looking at this that we don't superimpose onto God as our father, our human imperfect fathers. God is completely trustworthy. And as we've been walking all the way through his word, God has been reorientating who he is in his majesty and his glory. And when we see this term, our father, there's a fullest sense that this is what he's talking about, one with integrity, trustworthy. And this is, this is, so, this is so huge. I just kind of wipe this off here and go on to the next. There's six, compo- there's six components to the, to, the Lord, to the Lord's prayer. And what's really interesting is you walk them through, he starts with our Father in heaven. So God is Lord over all nations. He's creator, absolute, and supreme. We exist for him. And so he's laying that out. Our Father in heaven. So it's intimate, but it's also one of authority. One who is absolute. And he's declaring that at the outset. We're honoring him for who he is in his majesty and his glory. Notice notice that honor that's there. Secondly, he moves on into worship. Hallowed be your name. Honored, praised, holy is your name. There is worship in, 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 in your prayer. Lifting up God's name. It's ascribing worth. It's hallowed. You are absolutely holy. And there's that sense of worship and awe for who he is. And then he moves on into into submission. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So may your will rule over all. Be accomplished in my life and in the nations abroad. It also has that idea of a longing for his future and his permanent kingdom to come, to his rule over all things. And it says, your kingdom come, your will be done. We desire that you're going to rule. We desire that you're going to be absolute, and we're submitting. Remember, we come back to humility. Lord God, I exist for you alone. And that's that submission, that laying and placing ourselves under who he is in his majesty and his glory. Next it goes on. To give us, give us our daily bread. And so it speaks of needs. It so affirms our entire dependency on a bountiful provider for all of our needs. Food, life, um, wisdom, strength. God gives it, gives it each moment, not often in advance. And we need to recognize because it's that dependent relationship where we're continually dependent upon him at every moment. And, and then he moves on into forgiveness. Forgive, forgive us our debts and our sins as we've forgiven others. To the level we've forgiven others, God forgives us. Forgiveness is hard, so we pray, Father, empower us to forgive others as you've forgiven us. And there's that intimacy, that, that level of relationship that comes into that. And then it moves on into, into dependency. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. It's also translated, don't let us yield to temptation. So we pray, Lord God, I can't overcome sin and Satan on my own. Please protect, please enable, please empower. And there's that dependency as we go forward, as we, as we understand that particular relationship. Now often, the Lord's prayers, we understand, is often ended with, for yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. And that's not in all translations, it's just in a few of them, but it still fits with what God has declared um, from his word. So as we understand, as we kind of walk through the Lord's prayer, there's a sense of communion with God that is absolutely intense, isn't it? And so intimate and so private. In it, we express honor, don't we? In in it, we express worship and submission, needs, forgiveness. It's communication with the one who is absolute. And this is so, so intense. But prayer is so intimate, it's so intimate that it's very sensitive to sin. Notice chapter 6, verses 14 and 15 of Matthew chapter 6. Go ahead and read that, please, uh, Marianne. For if you forgive men when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. Okay, so unforgiveness is a fence between you and God. How so? So as you notice that, notice the strength of the words. For if you forgive men when they sin against you, your Father in heaven will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their sins, your Father will not 
forgive you. And so unforgiveness places a fence up between us and God. How so? Why would God be so strong here in this unforg- about unforgiveness? Why does unforgiveness put a fence up between us and God? So you're going back to pride. How so? You're choosing not to forgive someone because they don't Yes, because, because again, we're lifting, we're lifting ourselves at the center of it. Absolutely. Okay, why else does unforgiveness put a fence up between us and God? Oh, yeah, excuse me, unforgiveness is sin. Absolutely. Unforgiveness is sin causes disunity, and so as a result, God cannot bless. Absolutely. So unforgiveness doesn't change our position with God. And we need to understand that as believers in Christ. But it deeply affects our fellowship and His active work in our lives. Unforgiveness is like a fence in our lives against God's supply. And forgiveness, no matter how difficult, opens up the fence for more growth and more understanding of truth. You see, as we go forward, remember back, as we come back to the unity in God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, that's what he's brought us into. That's what he desires that we as believers will live in. And if we choose, and if there's brokenness, disunity amongst us, we're not honoring the one who's, who's brought us into this intimate relationship. Remember, if we've seen how much God has forgiven us, then it will motivate us to forgive others. God stands ready to enable. Now think about this as we go through this. This is going to be huge. Notice here, forgiveness is a choice, an act of the will, not a feeling. A forgiveness is based on the truth that God has forgiven us. It's not on what is fair. A forgiveness may result in forgetting, but forgetting is never the means to forgive, uh, forgiveness. Forgiveness is Holy Spirit empowered, not legalistic or fleshly grit your teeth response. It's the result of humility. A forgiveness unconditional from the heart, not conditional. These are huge to understand this. It continues on. Forgiveness is holistic, canceling the entire debt, not selective or partial or just suppressing your anger. A forgiveness allows God to execute his justice in his time and in his way. And it's not taking justice into our own hands. Forgiveness is complete, resolving the anger and the resentment by releasing the offense and the offender and not keeping, keeping a record. So think about this. If this is what forgiveness is, can you not see why Christ would declare, for for if you forgive men what they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. So as believers, as we go forward, do we need God to extend this level of forgiveness to us? Absolutely, moment by moment, don't we? And then to that level, he's calling us to also forgive others in the same way. Pretty intense, isn't it? Back to prayer. Let's go back to the beginning where prayer started. So let's stop and think about that. And so as we see this intimacy as what prayer is and how he elevates it, let's go back to the beginning to see where the foundations for prayer really is. So the foundations for prayer is in the very character of God. He is relational and he's created us to be relational with him. God communicates and he's created us with his ability to think, his ability to feel, and his ability to will. And so this prayer is not something that's outside of it that Christ just instituted now here at this point. No, this is something that's been right to his very character and his very nature from the very beginning because he's relational and he communicates. And so now think about this as we understand God is, God is eternal, He's he's, he's without beginning. And at some point, God decided that he was going to create you and I. At some point, he was going to create and relational and bind himself with us as human beings and and bring us in. He didn't have to. This was his choice to invite us in to that relationship, that prayer relationship, that intimacy of that relationship with him. And he's invited us in to enjoy him to that level of intimacy that, that, that God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit enjoys. And he's invited us into that. Isn't that incredible? He didn't have to. But he's invited us in and then he's created us with the ability to be able to enjoy him. So as we go back to the beginning, how do we see God's desire to communicate from the beginning of time? How do we see God's desire to communicate? Okay, case in point. When God created Adam and Eve, how did he communicate with Adam and Eve? Walked in the garden with them. So think about that. So prayer in that sense of what we are enjoying in prayer really is the same thing that God was doing with Adam and Eve in the very beginning. He was walking and he was talking. It was relational. It was intimate. It was personal. 
And so what God is inviting us into is the same thing that he was allowing for Adam and Eve in the beginning. How else has God communicated from the beginning? Because prayer is not an isolated thing. Now in Matthew chapter 6, it's not isolated. He's been doing it from the beginning. How else has God communicated in the beginning? I think a very telling thing is when Adam and Eve sinned, he went looking for them. Yes, because what did he do? Hey, Adam, where are you? And even Cain. Think about even when Cain, when Cain blew it, did God reject Cain? No, God communicated in. God reached out. He pursued relational, giving them opportunity to do what? To repent. So he didn't come to slap their, their wrists so much. He came to, for the purpose of wanting them to restore. He's wanting them to repent and respond so he could draw them back to why he created in the first place. How else have we seen God create, uh, God communicate from the beginning of time? Sorry? Yeah, Enoch. Enoch walked with God, and his relationship was so intimate. And again, it's hard for us to understand. His relationship was so intimate that he walked from this life into the next and he, without dying. Can you imagine what that looked like? We need, to, we need to sit down with Enoch one day and have him. What, what was that conversation look like? What did that look like to walk from this life into the next? Can you imagine? Okay, how else have we seen God communicate from the beginning? At yeah, Mount Sinai, God came down and spoke audibly, didn't he? Moses went up into the mountain and heard God speak personally to him. How did God, how did God speak to, to Jacob? In a dream, didn't he? There's time that God sent angels, didn't he, to speak to Mary, for instance. He came and he spoke to Mary through an angel. And there's other situations. God spoke through prophets. But what is, the, what is one of the, 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 the largest ways or the biggest ways that God has communicated, showing his desire for relationship and communion? What is one of the biggest ways that he's revealed that? Yeah, person of the Holy Spirit. But then also, what took place here? What took place here? God himself came to earth and took on flesh to, 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 to establish, to, to walk with us so that we could talk with him face to face. This is, this is so personal, and God has given us his word. And I think if we were to look to an example of what God thinks and what God views of that communion, we need to go back to Exodus chapter 33. Exodus chapter 33. When Moses is up on Mount Sinai receiving the, the, the law... There's a conversation, an ongoing conversation that Moses had with God himself. And I believe that there's a level of of what God begins to reveal. And it's almost, it's so private, it's so intimate, it's almost, we almost feel embarrassed to kind of step in on the conversation. It's so intimate as Moses and God are having this conversation in Exodus chapter 33. And we'll begin reading at, at verse 13. And if you have time, read through this passage of Scripture. Begin back at, a later, at an earlier point when Moses begins having that conversation. Let's read verse 13 to 23, and I'll, I'll read this here. Notice what it says, and this is Moses speaking. If you are pleased with me, teach me your ways, so I may know you and, continue to, and to continue to find favor with you. Remember that this nation is your people. Like, think about this. This is Moses. Who's Moses talking to? He's talking to God Almighty. And, and notice, notice the, what's involved in this. If you are pleased with me, teach me your ways. There's a, there's a humility there. There's, there's a pouring out his heart before God so I may know you and continue to find favor. Remember that this nation is your people. Verse 14, the Lord replied, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. Then Moses said to him, if your presence does not go with us, do not send us up from here. How will anyone know that you are pleased with me and with your people unless you go with us? What else will distinguish me and your people from all the other people on the face of the earth? And the Lord said to Moses, verse 17, I will do the very thing that you have asked because I am pleased with you and I know you by name. Can you imagine? Moses is having a conversation and God is declaring a level of intimacy, a level of acceptance that is just out of this world. Notice verse 18. Then Moses said, now show me your glory. And the Lord said, I will cause all of my goodness to pass in front of you and I will proclaim my name, the Lord in your presence. I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. But he said, you cannot see my face for no one may see me and live. Then the Lord said, there is a place near me where you may stand on a rock. 
When my glory passes by, I will put you in the cleft in the rock and cover you with my hand until I've passed by. Then I will remove my hand and you will see my back, but my face must not be seen. I think there's a sense, in a sense, of the level of of intimacy, of communion that God is declaring, this deep communion with God. And in these components, we're seeing honor. We see Moses honoring and worshiping, submitting and declaring needs, forgiveness and dependency that comes through it, all woven in the fabric of of this conversation that he's having with God to that level. So think about that. As we pray, we're doing the same thing. As we pray, we're being drawn into deep communion with God where we're expressing honor and worship and submission and needs and forgiveness and dependency. But to arrive at that level of communion, we need to deal with unforgiveness. Because as we said, if we're not, if we're walking in unforgiveness, there is a fence that's put up and our intimacy with God is hindered. Because that's a barrier that's put up with there. We don't want to be hypocrites pretending that that all is well when we're refusing to forgive somebody else. You see, we, if we do, we're just going to go through the motions and that, limit, that Im- intimacy is limited. You see, bitterness has so many roots and it's a cancer of the soul. And that's why Christ deals with it so strongly in Matthew chapter 6. And we need to see this. So therefore, we need to ask ourselves the following questions. Think about this. Am I up to date on my forgiving of everyone? Or maybe I need to turn the question out, am I up to date in asking everyone for forgiveness too? Am I holding a grudge or bitter against anyone? You see, if there's bitterness and unforgiveness in our heart, we're not going to end, we're not going to engage with what God's designed us for in this deep communion. Here's another one. Am I, am I talking too much about what others have done to me? See, God, God is not to be messed around with. This is, this is so absolutely intimate, this relationship that he's designed us for. There's no mucking around in this. There's an intensity to There's There's, there's a, a reality to this. Now think about this. Now forgiveness is impossible on our own. We need to confess it to God and say, hey God, because I don't know where we come from. I don't know the level of junk that we've walked through. But God seeks to walk with us and to enable us to walk in forgiveness, not so that he rubs our nose in, it, but so that he draws us into this intimacy of communion to remove the cancer, to remove the acid that we continue to drink in, that we continue to hold on to. We can't do this on our own. We need to ask him to enable and to give us strength. Remind, and remember that when it seems that we can't forgive, remember how much we've been forgiven for. And let's walk in this in reality to it. Just by way of review here, prayer is telling God what we know he knows to get to know it as he does. Prayer is enjoying intimate conversation, fellowship with God himself. Prayer is simple, reverent, and unselfish. It's so real and so serious that it's not something that we just play around with. Prayer connects us with the voice of God that will readily obey even in the hard things, um, and it's, it's our, our means to deal with sin. This is the level of unity and harmony that Christ has brought us into. This intimacy begins in the present and will grow until we see him face to face. And then for all of eternity, we'll be unhindered fellowship with him face to face. No more sin, no more separation, no more brokenness, no more angst, absolute unity. See, it's deep communion with God that he's he's designed us for. And it involves, in it we express honor, worship, submission, needs, forgiveness, and and dependency. So huge to to see these truths.